Good day, I'm Norman Wappinger. We're moving to set up abstract algebra and we've outlined some challenges that the uh, modern treatment faces. And this is our third challenge, the fundamental dream of algebra, which is usually known as the fundamental theorem of algebra. But unfortunately, this is not really a theorem currently. This is a very big topic. It has huge implications throughout mathematics. So it's a very foundational kind of issue and completely appropriate for this playlist, this channel, where we're dealing with foundational issues. So the fundamental theorem of algebra, we have to address some unpleasant, uncomfortable truths about this very important and interesting result, but logically problematic. Okay, so it's a fundamental result or claim from undergraduate mathematics. And in fact, there's a couple of different forms of the fundamental theorem. So I'd like to distinguish between them by calling the first one uh, the fundamental theorem of algebra number one. And it is that every polynomial p of x equals a0 plus a1x plus up to a n x to the n. So this is a polynomial in x of degree n greater than or equal to 1. So there's at least a single x appearing somewhere. Has a complex 0, r equals a plus bi. What does that mean? It means that p of r equals 0. So it means that if you have a non-constant polynomial, then you can find a complex number so that when you substitute that complex number in for the x, then the total result is zero. Okay, now we have to understand that these coefficients that are appearing here are usually taken to be real numbers. And the a and the b appearing here in this description of complex numbers are also taken to be real numbers. Now, uh, that of course is hugely problematic because there's uh, all kinds of difficulties as we've seen with the theory of real numbers. So that's a big part of the problem, but there is more as well. So this is the first version of fundamental theorem, that every non-constant polynomial has a complex number zero or root. And now here is the second version or alternate version of the fundamental theorem of algebra, which asserts that a polynomial of degree at least one can be factored as a product of linear factors if we're allowing ourselves complex coefficients. So it's saying that we can find complex numbers r1, r2 up to rn, where n is the degree of the polynomial, and a lambda real number, so that the polynomial is actually equal to lambda times the factor x minus r1 times the factor x minus r2 all the way up to the factor x minus rn. And then these numbers are the zeros, or the roots, of the polynomial. Clearly, if we replace x with, say, one of these r's, say r1, then one of these terms will be zero, and so the whole product will be zero. And as before here, uh, all these coefficients are generally real numbers. Although it turns out that there's a, then a somewhat more general version of this a theorem which extends the same statements to the case where the coefficients are not just so-called real numbers but are in fact more general complex numbers themselves and the theorem still holds true. So some of the ways that the fundamental theorem of algebra ends up being used in undergraduate mathematics is through the consequence that if you have a real polynomial that then you can deduce that it factors into a product of linear and quadratic factors, all of whose coefficients are real numbers. So even if you're a little bit unhappy about or unfamiliar with complex number arithmetic, a consequence of this is that if you have an arbitrary polynomial with so-called real coefficients or maybe rational coefficients, then you can write it as a product of linear and quadratic factors, all with real or possibly rational coefficients, although typically real. That has a lot of uh, applications. For example, it's uh, used a lot to justify certain integration formulas uh, using the idea of partial fractions. So it's a, it's a key tool in the theory of integration. And it also allows all kinds of solutions to various 
problems like recurrence relations, differential equations, eigenvalue problems, problems uh, coming from combinatorics involving generating functions, and other things too. So there's quite a lot of situations where we need to find zeros of polynomials or we need to factor polynomials and it's always the fundamental theorem that is the workhorse that, uh, that lets us assert such zeros or factorizations. But it's not just pure mathematics that uses this kind of thinking a lot. Also applied mathematics leans very heavily on the fundamental theorem of algebra. So there's a wide variety of problems coming from physics, engineering, chemistry, and uh, also economics and industry that one way or the other need to extract zeros of polynomials and factorization. So here's a picture of a bunch of springs that uh, separate masses M1, M2, M3, M4 and they're allowed to oscillate this way because they're these springs. And they have different masses and you might be interested in understanding how these coupled oscillators behave. Okay, And that's a kind of problem that once you set it up in physics involves these kinds of uh, polynomials have to be solved. There's a wide variety of such problems. Uh, for example, Google PageRank algorithm has some connection with this. Neural nets, stress matrices, rotations. One can give a very, very long list of real life applications, ultimately, of the fundamental theorem of algebra. So it's not just a theoretical uh, tool, it's also very important for practical applications. Now, for us, we're interested in setting up abstract algebra, and so we have to make the point that in abstract algebra, also these theorems play a very important role. So, for example, the fundamental theorem really underpins character theory for groups. So, once I'm studying group theory, non commutative finite group theory, there's a theory of characters, and the fundamental theorem is intimately connected with that theory. It's also the basis for much of field theory. When we set up fields and look at concrete examples of fields, and especially the associated area called Galois theory, the fundamental theorem and its role are sort of intimately uh, woven into this uh, theory. It's uh, very important for structure theory of matrices. Um, matrices and fundamental theorem of algebra are intimately connected. Uh, for example, Jordan canonical form. Um, and eigenvalue problems uh, are all associated with this, but it has a role in abstract algebra. Algebraic number theory is very much relying on this uh, kind of thinking of the fundamental theorem because it tries to embed a lot of the uh, fields and, and rings that occur in uh, number theory in, in the complex numbers, and that's essentially playing this uh, game. And it also underpins the importance of complex algebraic geometry. In algebraic geometry, we study curves and higher dimensional extensions called varieties. And for various technical reasons, one likes to work over the complex numbers rather than the more natural, uh, intuitive, sort of rational or real numbers. And a lot of the reason for that is because Invoking the fundamental theorem makes a lot of things uh, easier. So this is a very common orientation in uh, algebraic geometry. Again, ultimately coming down to the fundamental theorem. So this is a very important result for undergraduate and higher mathematics. It figures prominently in a wide range of mathematics and also applications to applied mathematics. But uh, for us, it also has a major uh, input into abstract algebra. So how sad is it that in fact, these theorems are actually seriously logically flawed? It's very unfortunate. And it's something that people I know would rather not hear and would rather not learn about. They would like to pretend that things are okay, but they are not in fact okay. okay there are serious problems and in fact, these theorems have to be recast, they have to be rethought, and there's a lot of very, very important work and opportunities for young people to come and to help in reconfiguring the mathematics around the fundamental theorem of algebra. So we're going to be talking about that. 
So unfortunately, the reality is that the fundamental theorem of algebra parts one and two that we've discussed are actually dreams currently. They are not real theorems. They are dreams. They are the result of wishful thinking and insufficient attention paid to rigor and careful analysis. There are many proofs of the fundamental theorem of algebra, and this is already one indicator of the logical difficulties that the subject has. So many people have come along and tried to pin down, first of all, what this theorem is really about, and then provide some kind of argument for it. Many people have thought that they have an argument, and then later generations come along and say, well, wait a minute, he was actually assuming something or other there, and that's not entirely justified. And then they give a new proof, and then some decades later, someone comes along and states the same thing about their arguments. So this has been going on for a long time, going back probably first to D'Alembert, and Euler prominently was also very interested in the fundamental theorem. And then Lagrange, Laplace, Gauss, Cauchy, Weierstrass, it's like a who's who of famous mathematicians try to understand what was really going on with this fundamental theorem and to try to provide proofs. And it didn't stop with Weierstrass. Many 20th century authors have also contributed new proofs. In fact, Gauss contributed probably half a dozen proofs. So he would prove it and then wait a few years and then come up with another proof. And it's probably because he recognized that there was something not quite solid. There was need for further understanding. Because this, this topic touches base with what I think is really the fundamental problem in mathematics, which is the nature of the continuum. And I'll talk about that in my, more in my next video. But the nature of the continuum is actually a very subtle issue. And it's intimately connected with the fundamental theorem of algebra. And so mathematicians have wrestled with this for a long time. And I'm claiming that, in fact, unfortunately, all of these proofs or attempted proofs are incomplete or wrong. Unfortunately, they don't really work. So even the current statements of the theorems are faulty. And you can see that in a simple way, because if you have a theorem that rests crucially on real numbers, and you don't have a proper theory of real numbers, well then obviously you're in strife. Okay? And the fact that we don't have proper theory of real numbers uh, almost immediately um, implies that there's going to be problems with things like the fundamental theorem of algebra that crucially rely on properties of real numbers. But in fact we can see the problems in a much more direct way. So mathematics is not just about theorizing and making abstract theories. It's also about examples, explicit examples and concrete computations. And we don't want to divorce ourselves from contact with these explicit examples and concrete computations. So for example, most undergraduates, they don't really see a proper proof of this fundamental theorem of algebra, even though they use it many, many, many places, until perhaps in a third year complex analysis course. So there's usually a place somewhere after you've done Leoville's theorem there, the a proof is presented, but it's almost always not very convincing to your typical undergraduate who goes, okay, now I, I have some abstract argument which I probably don't really believe. But if there was really a convincing argument, then that convincing argument could be supported by examples. Right? So we could give the argument and then we could say, and here, by the way, guys, here's some examples of how it actually works. But unfortunately, the fundamental theorem of algebra falls down as soon as you start looking at examples. You don't have to go very far and you see that, wait a minute, there is some divergence between the claims that are made and what actually happens in concrete situations. Let me illustrate. Here is an example. And there's nothing particularly special about this example. P of x equals x to the fifth minus 2x plus 3. That's a polynomial of degree 5. It has, in this case, integer entries, so it's particularly simple. We can graph it, or at least we can graph part of it. Okay, so it has some kind of shape like this for values, say, between minus 3 and 3. We can see that it crosses the x-axis seemingly. 
somewhere around here between minus one and minus two, it goes up here, has a little a maximum there, and it comes down a little minimum, then it goes up again. Okay, so what's the claim here? The claim is, first of all, that this thing has a, a zero. We can see that without using the fundamental theorem of algebra, but we can see it from the picture, can't we? And we're going back now to Newton's method. Newton can see that there's a zero there, and to evaluate that zero, he can create this algorithm that will, well, not actually give you the zero, but which will give you a sequence of approximations, which will give you points on the x-axis which are closer and closer to having the property that p of x is zero. So we've talked about Newton's method, which is very important, uh, at some length earlier in this series. So the Math Foundation's 83 up to 86 uh, lectures are all about that. And they give you a way of successively creating a sequence of values which are closer and closer to where this function ostensibly crosses the x-axis. So it certainly suggests, the picture suggests that yes, there is some point, but in fact the actual logical structure of that statement is not at all obvious. It's not at all obviously clear that we understand continuity well enough to really be able to assert that there actually is an exact value of x for which this polynomial takes on the value zero. Okay, but I can get my computer. I can set this equal to zero and I can ask my computer to solve. And it will do so, at least up to a certain resolution that I can input beforehand. So if I ask it, say, for eight decimal places, something like that, then it will tell me that a zero, or a solution to p of x equals zero, is, say, given by minus 1.4236058. That, according to my computer, is a solution to the equation p of x equals zero. In other words, that's a root or zero of the polynomial. Great. But if I want to check, and I actually take this exact value and plug it in here, and get my computer to evaluate that, it does not give me zero. It evaluates it, again to eight decimal places, as 8.9999626 times 10 to the minus 7. 10 to the minus 7, so that's a relatively small quantity, but it's definitely not zero. All right, then I can up the resolution, so I can go into my program and ask it to evaluate things, not to eight decimal places, but to, uh, you know, maybe 16 decimal places or something like that. Okay, so I've done that, and I've asked it again to solve p of x equals zero, and it's come up with a better value. So here's the same kind of thing as we had before, but now we have some more digits. So is this the right answer? Well, it's a better answer, at least it's more accurate. If we plug this, however, into the polynomial and actually evaluate it, our computer will tell us that we get something which is about minus 4.8376541 times 10 to the minus 20. Well, this is not exactly what we get. There's more digits here, but this is to eight decimal places. That's what we get. In particular, we're not getting something that's zero. We're getting something that's getting small because that's 10 to the minus 20, so it's a very small quantity, but it's definitely not zero. And this is the reality of it. Okay? This is the reality that, yes, you can get more and more digits, and so you're getting closer and closer to having a number that you can plug in here to get zero. But you cannot actually get at such a number. You cannot get at it. So this is why discussions of this in undergraduate texts are always kind of limited. People don't want to explore this very clearly and carefully because then undergraduates would be starting to go, well, wait a minute, uh, you're claiming that there's a number that is a zero of this thing, but you can't actually exhibit such a number. So why should we believe the arguments? Maybe there's some problem here. Well, yes, there is a problem. Okay, There's a very serious problem, logically. All right, so here's my claim. Wahlberger's claim that in direct contradiction to the fundamental theorem of algebra, part one, there is, in fact, no number r in C satisfying p of r, which is r to the fifth minus 2r plus 3 equals zero. 
I claim there is no such number. This is in direct contradiction to the fundamental theorem of algebra. I do not dispute that there are complex numbers that you could plug in here and you would get something that's close to zero. I do not dispute that at all. I'm happy to believe that. I'm happy to believe that you can get values here for which this thing is some very, very small complex number that's very, very close to zero. No problem. But you cannot find a number r, complex number, such as p of r equals zero. So this is a very direct claim, isn't it? I mean, we're not talking about philosophy here. It's not a question of opinion. It's not something that someone can say, well, I have an axiomatic position that says such and such. I'm making a very direct claim about the existence of a solution to a polynomial equation. And I challenge any mathematician to prove me wrong. And you can prove me wrong by showing us a number r, a complex number r, that I can then plug in and check. So you can do whatever you like and use all kinds of sophisticated cohomological theories if you like. But at the end of it, you have to give me an r. And I'm going to take that r, and I'm going to plug it into p of r, and I'm going to see whether or not your r actually works. And I claim that it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. And so the fundamental theorem of algebra is incorrect. It is just not true. Now, there will be people who will say, well, wait a minute, Norman. I can exhibit such an R for you. What you do is you start doing this procedure. Okay? You do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and you keep on going to infinity, and at the end of infinity, you will have such an R. So, they will give us a prescription for finding such an R that involves an infinite number of steps. Now, I'm not able to do an infinite number of steps, so I'm not happy to be given such a prescription. But if someone has such a, a philosophy towards finding such an R, then I suggest that they themselves carry out the infinite number of steps. And after they have done so, then they can exhibit the end result to us. All right? So I'm not interested in someone telling me a procedure that will find such an R. I'm interested in someone actually exhibiting such an R directly. That's not going to happen. That's why the fundamental theorem of algebra is wrong. And for a very similar reason, the second version of the fundamental theorem of algebra doesn't work either. So if we take our same polynomial and ask our computer for all of the complex zeros, it will give us some answers. So it will give us the number that we've already seen, and it will give us also four other ones which are not visible on the graph that we drew. Okay, they're not actually corresponding to places where the graph crosses the x-axis because we're talking about complex values. But nevertheless, here are these complex numbers that have the property that when you plug them in, you get something that's very close to being the complex number zero, like zero plus zero i. But notice that these things here have the same aspect as this one does. So I'm putting three dots here now to represent the fact that my computer actually has a range of possible things that it can give me depending on the resolution level that I've asked it for. It doesn't give me a unique answer. It depends on how many digits I have asked it to give me an answer for. So it's a little bit open-ended, but nevertheless, there's something in this direction. Your computer will find something in this direction as well. So there's this one plus i, and then there's the same values really with a minus sign there. These are called complex conjugate pairs. And then there's another pair like this involving these two numbers, plus and minus. And here's the number uh, which are the coefficients of i. Okay, so in the same way, this is very explicit, right? If the fundamental theorem of algebra part two really did work, then we could write our polynomial as a product of linear factors. And the linear factors would correspond exactly to these five numbers. So we could form the expression x minus r1, x minus r2, x minus r3, x minus r4, x minus r5. And you can do this. You can plug the values that you have in. That will necessarily mean making a choice. You know, your computer will give you a certain number of digits and you will have to use that certain number of digits in order to create these linear factors. And then you can get your computer to 
evaluate that product and you will see that you have a polynomial which is pretty close to this one in the sense that the difference between these two polynomials is another polynomial with very small coefficients. You know, the coefficients are like 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 20 or something like that. So these things are very close to being the same polynomial, but they're not actually the same polynomial. The fundamental theorem of algebra part 2 does not work either. Now, does this render all those applications of the fundamental theorem to physics and chemistry and industry and so on, you know, wrong? No, not at all. Because the applied mathematician doesn't need the pure form of the fundamental theorem. They only need the approximate form. They only need to know that we can find complex numbers such that this thing is very close to this. They only need to find a zero in the sense that we have some number, so that when we plug in, we get a number which is very close to zero. Because to an engineer, if something is zero to eight or twenty decimal places, then it's effectively zero for them. They don't care if theoretically it's not zero. Right? So the fundamental theorem of algebra is always going to be an important and useful tool for applied mathematicians. The question is, how shall we pure mathematicians understand it? How shall we think about what's really going on? This is a huge challenge for modern mathematics, and in fact, a challenge that has very, very big ramifications for abstract algebra. So we're going to talk more next time about how we can move forward on this challenge. What is the fundamental theorem of algebra really? What can we actually aspire to in terms of setting it up correctly? I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.